Hello everyone, welcome to the webinar, It's Time to Rethink Enterprise Architecture. I'm Caitlin and I'll be your moderator for this online event. Before we begin, please just ensure that your microphones are muted. If you have any technical issues during the event, please click on the moderator chat button and I'll assist you with your request. There is also an event chat feature that allows you to discuss various items with other attendees. There will also be some polls for you to answer and some questions for you to answer, and we encourage participation. The webinar will run for approximately 40 minutes, and at the end of the presentation, there will be time for questions and answers. There are two options for asking questions. Option one is using the Q&A feature, which allows you to type questions directly to Steve, which he'll answer during the designated Q&A time. Option two is that you can use the raise hand feature, the icon for this is a hand symbol and should be located on the right side of your screen. Once your raised hand request has been accepted, you'll be promoted to presenter so you can voice your question to Steve. At the end of the webinar, we'll also be announcing an exclusive webinar attendee promotional offer, so stay tuned. This webinar is proudly sponsored by EA Principles and will be hosted by Dr. Steve Ellis. Dr. Steve is a sought after authority within the enterprise architecture and business transformation community and has a rich background of experience, including founder and CEO of EA Principles, trainer to over 6,000 individuals in the field of EA, chief architect, EA consultant to numerous government and private sector companies, and he's also a retired US Air Force pilot. We trust that you will enjoy this webinar Steve, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Caitlin, and hello, everyone. So I've been thinking about EA for a good 20 years, and I'm rethinking about it lately. And I wanted to stimulate some some thoughts about that as uh, to uh, follow on with other discussions uh, via email and possibly workshops and so forth. I want to do this in order to better ensure success with enterprise architecture. We've, we've been doing enterprise architecture for over 20 years, but I don't think that we're on a glide path for more assured success right now. I find that's troubling, but I, but I see a way forward. I'm optimistic. I think there are a lot of wonderful drivers and we'll discuss a lot of those uh, today, but let's go ahead and, and get started. I'm gonna touch uh, a lot of topics within this overall framework of rethinking uh, EA, and I'm going to share a lot of material, and we're going to follow up uh, for those who signed up with all our sources. So EA is, is at a major crossroads, in my opinion. I think there's a lot of dissonance that people need to confront. We're mesmerized, for example, by Gartner's Magic Quadrant for Enterprise Architecture Tools. I think it's really quite an outstanding document. It's very educational, but it's, it's kind of set in a make-believe world where one could buy EA tools and succeed with EA. And that's just uh, not really the case. And also, <clears throat> Gartner, in my opinion, is not that strong of an advocate for the enterprise architecture discipline. Um, although they do earn a lot of money from consulting on EA, I think that uh, based on my experience at their various conferences for CIOs, it's almost a footnote to other things that they're talking about like AI or blockchain or <clears throat> things like that that really need architecture. But when Gartner talks about architecture, it almost apologizes for doing so other than at its EA summit, which it holds annually. So why is there this disconnect between, hey, we have these wonderful tools, but we don't have any kind of assured way uh, that we can simply explain to you how to how to get started uh, with EA. So as one presenter said in the 2018 timeframe at a big Gartner event with a lot of CIOs present, it is so easy to do EA badly and so hard to do it well. So they're promoting design thinking, for example, a lot more aggressively than, than they are EA. And as I said, it's almost at the big events where the CIOs attend, EA is, is almost apologized for every time it's mentioned. Yet, of course, there are all these wonderful tools that you could buy that would help you succeed with EA. So there is some dissonance there. And I think it's time to reflect on this and adjust 
accordingly. <clears throat> so I see some overall EA anti-patterns. Although I'm a champion of, of tools, I, I really think tools need to be looked at and, and enhanced further, in fact, in light of the complexity that we confront. So we need tools that deal with complexity. We need aug augmented intelligence. We need uh, artificial intelligence. We need, we need uh, a, lot, a lot more confidence about the data that we're using and so dependent on for doing enterprise architecture. So fundamentally, it comes down to the, the knowledge, the information, and the data, which I call the kid stuff. If you can't get the kid stuff right, you can't do anything else uh, regarding better informed decisions faster, which is what we're seeking through, through enterprise architecture. Better decisions about our architecture landscape, which is, depends on our business model, as well as technology decisions and investments. So we have, uh, we have that overemphasis of EA tools up front. So it's not that they're a bad thing, it's just that a lot of people think they have to make a decision about them before they even understand EA, and that's sad. <clears throat> and that links to misunderstanding and misuse of EA frameworks, enterprise architecture frameworks. That's a, a very serious uh, issue, uh, and um, I think that um, this is one reason Gartner is doing so well on consulting because it's saying, look, every case is unique, so let us help you uniquely with your EA challenges. I think there's a lot of value from EA frameworks, and we should spend a lot more time understanding where that value is and how to integrate value from this extensive body of knowledge into our, our own practices um, up front before we make, make big investments otherwise. There's a lack of support, though, from EA frameworks on how to roll out and operate EA successfully, including an EA tool. So that's that's a bit of a conundrum there. Do you think an EA framework would, would tell you how you set up an EA framework successfully in your vertical, in your type of organization, and in your organization, that there would be more, more specific guidance? I'm going to address that a little bit more later as I've developed with uh, some partners an extensive um, customizable web form. Actually, it's 100 web forms to help you start doing enterprise architecture right away, customizing the types of uh, questions you would ask to get the kind of information you need based on where you're at in the rollout of your EA program. So starting with just that, that simple approach, you know, what questions must we answer and uh, where do we keep that information and how do we share it and in terms of what decisions we need to make about our tools, about our frameworks, about our organization, about our structure, about our processes, et cetera. And I really am surprised by the lack of basic knowledge about EA content. And I'll use a scary word for some people, meta models. And so I, I've trained a lot of people, for example, in the, the uh, open group architecture framework, TOGAP, as well as the DOD architecture framework and the federal enterprise architecture framework among other frameworks, and I'm also certified in SAFE, the, the Scalable Agile Framework. So I, I know quite a bit about, about frameworks, but when I see people starting to talk about, okay, let's get started with our EA program, then one person will say, okay, I'll do the baseline business architecture, and you do the target business architecture, and you go, well, what do you mean by business architecture? Well, we're not on the same sheet of music. You know, if we don't have the same vocabulary on what is business architecture or data architecture, application architecture, infrastructure architecture, right? Network architecture. So, so there's a there's a, a need to get back to basics. Um, so an anti-pattern is trying to do EA without understanding meta models. So that's um, overly simplistic. It's 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 making too big of a leap. It's like you you want to you want to be a carpenter, but you don't know how to use uh, a sander. OK, you don't understand the basic tools of the craft. And I think well, that's where we're at in, in enterprise architecture, still overly hyped. And a lot of the basics aren't there on method and on content. And the other thing is uh, that it's an anti-pattern is seeing enterprise architecture as a competitive approach for change and for decision support rather than an integrative one. So enterprise architecture to, to succeed must be an integrated type of approach linked to strategic planning, investment uh, management, acquisition management, of course, to to um, uh, any any kind of change management at all, 
uh, whether it's business or technology. So that's something that, that we talk about, for example, in the open group architecture framework TOGAF, we say, well, you need to synchronize and harmonize your EA approach with all the other approaches you're using for change, for, for um, risk, et cetera. But we don't tell you exactly how to do that, right? So that's where, you know, work with some of the questionnaires, like I mentioned, to help customize based on your increasing maturity. You know, how would you in fact synchronize and harmonize a young EA type approach. And this is another another aspect of thinking of, tied to this uh, approach of setting it up like a program rather than perhaps like a product. Now, I haven't included that in, in written form, but that's one of the themes of this discussion today is the anti-patterns that the assumption, and we'll see that in some of the maturity models here in a moment, is that you're setting up EA as a program that will never die. It's an evergreen program. Well, that's maybe an anti-pattern for, for many organizations, and it works against EA's success. If we were to think about it more as a product that has to bring value incrementally and predictably, well, then we'd probably set about it quite differently. <clears throat> so some initial recommendations. Uh, I, I strongly believe the recommendations I'm providing for you here, based on having having been involved with enterprise architecture for nearly 20 years and, and formerly working for a large EA tool vendor. So I know quite a bit about EA tools and, and frameworks and other kinds of frameworks besides EA frameworks, in fact. But I do think that for the method and content part that I'm talking about that are so fundamental to break the anti-patterns I've seen, are I think TOGAF training and, and ARCHIMATE training uh, and certification are really important for the epiphanies of what does it mean to be an architect, to think like an architect. So TOGAF provides the best wide-ranging and openly available body of knowledge on setting up and running an EA method with some familiarization as well on content. But for real mastery, at uh, at least at the you know if I can say at the foundational level where you have a complete uh, meta model um, at your at your fingertips, Archimate is is wonderful, and uh, and basic mastery is is easily achieved. It gives you confidence about the very nature of architecture. Architecture is about elements and relationships linked to your targeting targeted capability, and tied to your design thinking. Right. What is what is your method for designing and you're choosing different elements and relationships again as you're moving to the future with change with with perhaps very large change. So I think uh, learning Archimate is one of the best ways for an ar architect to learn a com and apply a complete content meta model within a few days <clears throat> and then adding in some swim lane knowledge as well is, is is a nice adjunct so that you're covering both capability-based planning with Archimate, high-level process modeling, and then the possibility to go into detailed process modeling and all at virtually no expense except for your training. Uh, and uh, and we can certainly encourage you to be formally trained and, and be careful about about your uh, who you, whom you select for your training. <clears throat> So I do think that uh, applying TOGAF aligned thinking enriched with some basic Archimate modeling uh, on a practical opportunity problem scenario are, are, is something that's very important uh, that, that this be done within 90 days of having achieved the two certifications. These can be done within six weeks with no problem. And during that time, one could also have workshops to say, okay, what would be our, our proof of concept for applying our newly gained insights about what enterprise architecture method and content are all about. So that's that's one path. And so notice I didn't say that, hey, we have to set up the EA program first and buy a, a big expensive EA tool first, because in fact, I don't think that's, that's really gonna be done very well if you don't understand uh, basic things like generic TOGAF and basic meta model for architects like uh, Archimate. And also think about how you would apply that in a real world scenario, such as perhaps starting with a, 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 an, in, an incremental approach to building up an EA capability. But TOGAF and Archimate are just the beginning because we have to, there's so much more that we're gonna need and you'll see when I cover a couple of things in maturity models uh, to show the evolution of thinking about what does it mean to, to be able to do EA, right? So there's a lot of dissatisfaction out there with TOGAF, even though I'm a champion for it, 
<clears throat> it's really eye opening for folks if they if they go ahead and get good training on it. It's it's um it's generic. It's it, it's very broad. It's not very deep. It's a generic and simple methodology. But uh, it does have folks working uh, able to customize it with some help to very dynamic and complex business and technical realms. So again, these two standards can be terrific accelerators to learning what it, what it is to think like an architect, which means being able to target future capability with vision and road mapping. So a lot of people say, well, you know, frameworks are too linear, you know, they're not built for with complexity in mind. And well, I, I disagree with that. I, I think that it's how you how you set up your your analysis with iterations, with uh, again perhaps augmented intelligence, with some extra sophisticated uh, analytic tools, um, but but certainly uh, testing different scenarios. I think there's a lot we could do to to uh, bring the thinking about uh, architecture up to date. And other than it's just hey, let's take a snapshot of our baseline, a snapshot of our target, and do the gap analysis as if everything's static. No, everything is not static. I mean, nothing is static. In fact, right? So, so being able to to tackle uh, a definition of of uh, evolving ch uh, requirements is is really a tough challenge, and it's something beyond human intelligence. In fact, uh, to do uh, certainly on the back of a, of an envelope. So the ability to do impact analysis and what if analysis, of course, these are really critical to, to being seen as valuable as an architect, as people look for advice. So one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is how to set up EA in an integrated environment. Just one idea I toss out here uh, that goes a little bit to, contrary to the idea of I got to set up a big EA program before I can do anything else with architecture. I think we need to think more broadly about what architecture is. It's about design, it's about innovation, it's about management. So I, I think something like a strategy architecture management and innovation office would be something that, that would make sense uh, for, uh, and something that could be enduring, but you, EA would just be a part of that, of course, and that would be talking again to as if EA is a product, what are its features? What's it bringing, right? And I think it, and it does bring what I was just saying, the analysis above, uh, but it tied tied to the changing business and technical environment, uh, the need to, to have augmented intelligence over time, ability to have the data architecture so that you have assured information about what what you're working with and, uh, and and on what you're basing your decisions so i think that um this is a, is a concept i've given a lot of thought to those strategy architecture management and innovation because that has you looking near term medium term long term it has you looking at elements and relationships and your design approach it looks at managing your operational space as well as your strategy and architecture and innovation approaches and of course looking at innovation in terms of disruptive possibilities uh, the coming at you or, or that you could introduce uh, into your space so for those who aren't familiar with the TOGAF architecture development method I just wanted to show you the crop circle that the aliens left for us some time back in the uh, Iowa cornfield, we're still trying to decipher it. Now, I say TOGAF can be very valuable. I'm not gonna teach you TOGAF here. I have only a few minutes to really get through a lot of material, but I wanted to say that you look at outside the uh, main circle here, the cycle of A to H, you have preliminary, which you could think of as your EA capability. What's it take to have an EA capability that would allow me to come up with a vision uh, for a cycle of change and ultimately oversee the implementation of change. And then of course adapt my, my overall approach and my operational environment uh, with changing requirements in my space. And how do I look at things from different perspectives? Here we see business architecture, and then inside of information systems architectures, we have data and application architectures, and then we have technology architecture here. And then we do our road mapping, working with our solution architects, with, with our portfolio management folks and uh, HR procurement and so forth. Uh, in order to say what are the implementation choices to meet the gaps across these different domains in a holistic way, in a comprehensive way, uh, to meet our vision of change 
right? And then as investments come in, we start to, to uh, see how they align with where we said we wanted to go as an organization and where the EA capability fits in to that strategic plan and, and so on in light of, again, the changing business and, and technical uh, world that we're, that we're helping as a, almost a center of excellence uh, to, to uh, monitor and adjust uh, uh, decision-making toward. And then just a snapshot of uh, Archimate model <clears throat> uh, showing how technology layer supports the application layer, which supports the business layer. So that's why I say it's a very useful language. It goes beyond these layers as well. There are other aspects to Archimate, but, but even being able to talk about capability in terms of what, what layer, what, what, what are the apps using, what's the business using, and so on. So answer, answer questions like that. It's, it's, it's visual and it's, uh, it really is an accelerator to being able to talk about, again, what do I mean by, by uh, architecture? So I wanted to show you very briefly here the um, palette for, uh, for Archie, which is a free tool, open source tool for doing uh, Archimate. <clears throat> So you, again, you have relationship lines here. And so I, I'm gonna come, come down a bit here. Make this a little larger. All right. So I, I wanna just give you an example here if I zoom down. I have, when I said earlier, what's business architecture? Well, I not only have the terms for business architecture with Archimate, but I have the notation. So I can immediately start assigning an actor to a role. This is for like electronic whiteboarding here. And then I'm going to, I'm going to ultimately uh, work with some kind of, provide some kind of business service, right? And maybe offer a class or something. So you have this ability to uh, start using the, the common language uh, right away and worrying less about relationships initially, but then you have, I'm going to use some applications. I'm going to use some, some tech, some a smart device. Um, and so on. I'm going to use a network. Let me just come down here for a second. Then I can I can connect all these up later. But I'll use a, some kind of a network. So so mastering Archimate means you you can you know all of the relationship lines and you know all of the uh, elements and and then basically pretty good idea how you connect connect them to each other, which is a little more uh, challenging to to be comfortable with. But that comes with practice. And what we have with this free RG tool, and I, I do recommend other tools that you have to pay for as well, but I mean, for getting started, this is extremely useful. So you have a, a magic connector here. Oops, I go backwards here on that. I, I didn't mean to do that. So let's just, uh, so I go to the business actor and then I just go to the magic connector and it tells me what, what my choices are. And I know that I can assign an actor to a role. Right, and then what can I do with that role into that service? I can assign it as well. I can, I could execute it. So, so again, the combination of a method working across different perspectives, and having the notation handy, and uh, the different uh, relationship uh, uh, meanings uh, can can be extremely uh, useful to have uh, confidence as an architect. Uh, within a few weeks and actually start applying this. I've had some people get so excited about uh, the combination of a method and the content for a young EA practice that they're just rolling out uh, across a, a whole uh, CIO department that they want to write books about about what they're how they're applying it to different different scenarios. In fact, so so it is uh, it is uh, uh, worth some in some respects. I think. Um, not not believing all the naysayers about the basic uh, uh, framework like TOGAF, but you know, like with my training, I include other frameworks to show where, where TOGAF fits in and can borrow from other frameworks, how you could adjust it. And I also show other modeling languages besides uh, the Archimate language, so you see it in context. But it needs some starting point. These are wonderful starting points. So for the, for the um, next steps, I'm going to, I'm just going to give you a sense of uh, uh, how we're moving from the traditional EA thinking to more modern, modern uh, insights 
and I, I think you see it get a lot of value. I'm going to move through it quickly, but since we're recording it, you'll get a chance to uh, to uh, review it if you're interested. <clears throat> so I, I took a look back at uh, 2003, so we're talking over 15 years ago. The Government Accountability Office came out with an EA maturity management framework. And notice what they have for their major attributes. Demonstrates commitment. To what? To EA. So it's very EA centric, right? Ability to meet the capability to meet your commitment of, of providing EA. Demonstrates satisfaction of the commitment and verifies satisfaction of the commitment. That's, this is pretty primitive and very EA centric, but a lot of people still kind of kind of go to this. So what are the core elements um, for in terms of stage one, stage two, stage three? Well. Uh, stage one is that you create awareness of the EA of the of an EA program, as I said, and I want to think beyond program. I want to think about a, a EA capability, EA product, EA value. So, so the second stage is okay. Let's build that management foundation. Well, again, I'm already saying that maybe that's not so important uh, to start creating value. Uh, to have all that set up up front, maybe it's about you know building actually building that awareness through some actually developing products where then you go back and build the management foundation, right? So, so I, I think we need a more sophisticated thinking about, about uh, the maturity models, and I have more advice about that coming up. But uh, it's, it's legacy thinking, uh, very EA-centric, and we, we haven't seen EA programs like blooming everywhere and being hugely successful wherever they're planted uh, as they supposedly move up the ladders of awareness here. But stage one, again, it's saying that maybe you're, you're doing EA, but they're, they're, you have an ad hoc approach, uh, you lack support, and there's really no management foundation for it. And like I said, well, we could, be, we could create awareness by actually doing something, by creating some products. In some degree, uh, Gartner has supported that idea about let's just start doing things, right? And, uh, and not, not spend so much time up front on how do we set up the, the EA program. And that's uh, here, you know, how do I set up the people, the processes and tools? So people think, well, I, you know, that might take, I used to say that, oh, that would take like three years. So let's spend three years. And, you know, more recently, like six years ago, I had one company said, well, we need at least nine months. You know, to set up our EA capability before we can start adding value to any of the priority projects of our organization. Well, that doesn't work. I mean, you have to be, in effect, building your EA management while you're adding value. That's the that's pattern that's going to lead you to more success. This continues saying, of course, I need all my governance in place. And, well, it's hard to get that type of support, uh, heavy support, and all those charters and all of that, if people don't really understand uh, EA and uh, and see its results in some respects. So, so again, stage three is about let's show how we, how we could actually work it, formalize it, work with the different domains, adopt a framework, uh, and all that. Right. So this is very this is back over 15 years ago, and then we complete the EA, right? Where we create products and we have them reviewed and, uh, you know, it's the baseline target gap it's the sort of thing. And we have a way to maintain our EA and we got it written down and, you know, we're tracking everything according to it. And we're also uh, looking at overall change, uh, leveraging EA to manage change overall. Well, of course, that's what we should be doing right at the beginning as we show awareness, is that how EA can help you manage change. So, so we, I think we need to, to give a little more thought to, uh, you know, this, this is very linear. And I think that we can't, if we take this type of linear approach to rolling out EA, we're not likely to succeed. It's a very integrated, inter, inter, uh, iterative approach across these uh, stages. This is something that, um, that the book Enterprise Architecture as Strategy uh, came up with in terms of four, uh, four stages for maturity. You have your silos, and then you create uh, technology standards, and then you institute enterprise-wide standards, and then level four, you develop modularity for poss possible customizability and localization. Okay, so that that went less into what are the attributes and, uh, and more in terms of what, what needs to be done to where you, you really get um, valued 
value from reusability, for example, and that would be through through having understanding what are what works where in your organization and, and what 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 needs to be adapted for a particular part of the world or for particular laws or what have you, particular uh, line of business or VP tower. So that's uh, still uh, has some some good relevance that we 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 don't want to be stuck in silos. But, but that said, we could actually start building technology standards inside that silo, right? Inside a particular silo, and that'd still be better than a silo with no standards. So, so um, it, it doesn't have to be quite as linear as, as it looks here. Then we go to um, 2010, and the Government Accountability Office came up with a, a, a change, and a very comprehensive change to its maturity framework, and it shows um, it shows a couple of things here. Um, the governance, of course, you know, tied to decision making uh, and structure, behavior, or the content that I've mentioned. But then again, um, its use. Are we in fact using it? We set it up, but is anybody using it? And if they're using it, how are we measuring its effectiveness? So this was a, a sea change for 2010 to say, you know, let, let's go beyond. We, we we got some capability and say again who's using it and, and with what effect, all right? So that has some utility. <clears throat> and then they have, uh, uh, there's a um, maturity framework uh, that this is an example of elements coming out of the um, Department of Commerce architecture capability maturity model. We've seen uh, nine elements that, uh, that are looked at in terms of uh, moving from stage one to five, for example, what's our process now versus uh, at stage one versus what it could be at stage five, and you know. But here are here are nine uh, elements, and and one of the things that's missing here, this is I, you know, I have them maybe a little bit out of sync because the other one's 2010, but the 2009 is still not talking about what's the utility of it, right, and how are we measuring its effectiveness. <clears throat> so Gartner has some EA measurement categories here. And we say basic financial measures, productivity, efficiency, quality, effectiveness, and delivery process are the four categories for measurement for EA. <clears throat> and then they have uh, some things that you could measure uh, in terms of reuse. Uh, we talked earlier about use and, and measures. So here are some of the, the things that say we could actually see if the EA is making a difference. In these uh, in these areas, so um, so these are pretty these are pretty useful elements, and it continues on to this page, including you know how successful are we uh, with the program? So so that's this is some this is current. Uh, the, these are current Gartner measurement uh, uh, elements tied to the four uh, categories. <clears throat> okay, so I wanted to to breeze through an example of an organization that's using a combination of the legacy thinking and, and some of the more, more um, real world like modeling thinking and, and uh, knowledge of evolving technology. So it's just some sample material that I want to like say whiz through uh, for you uh, to show you some of their thinking. Now this actually ties back to defining EA, ties back to the book Enterprise Architecture Strategy saying we have to look at the way that we're designing our building blocks in terms of integration and standardization as we move to the future, to our target state, right? So what do we need to integrate and what do we need to standardize? So that's, this is a, a snapshot out of someone's actual uh, plan, planning, saying, so let's talk about integrated processes. How, how, would we, how would we, what do we mean by that? And what would that look like? A, a, a core system of, enterprise grade business platforms connected to any proprietary apps and business partners, All right? So you're getting into what does it mean? So for sharing through integration, and then you have your pillars, which are, are still the basic ones still are the business data, apps and technology. Um, but we add in security more and more. And I'd like to overlay also, uh, solution architecture or integrate solution architecture uh, in, in, in this. But this is a snapshot of this one organization's saying, look, we need to get a handle for, for these different perspectives of business apps and, and art, different artifacts 
that we want to, to use of to basic artifacts to get started. For data architecture, for example, the logical data to the application matrix, an application catalog, and for the technical architecture, we need to have uh, logical diagrams and understand our technology to architecture matrix. Then the goals of enterprise architecture. <clears throat> this is again, just a snapshot from a, a, a real time organization. So what are the strategies involved with EA? What are the capabilities that we're looking for? What, what are the products and services that we're going to, to help uh, make decisions about and help actually install and host and, and sustain. So, so uh, again, just a snapshot from, a, from a, an organization trying to evolve their EA practice right now. And they, they tie back to this idea of transformation uh, you, uh, of IT maturity with EA. And that's what they're focused on initially. That's a very common is to say, let's focus on the IT part of what we're doing. And that's often because the EA, um, well, a lot of the investments are of course, technology and, and IT related. So it's a common place uh, to start. <clears throat> and this is, is, is using the EA as strategy uh, items I just talked about, the bookie enterprise architecture strategy. We see silos, standardization, of the tech of the the standards, uh, IT standards, and then of ultimately being able to deliver enterprise-wide solutions, and be able to customize through uh, modularization. So it's a slight rewording, uh, but but they're very similar to what I showed you earlier. And then for the technology enablement, there are the grow the business, run the business, transform the business uh, principles. There, in terms of looking at what we need to change. Uh, in terms of that, and some common parameters and operational parameters, like for our apps, are they fringe apps tied to just particular uh, VP towers, or are they core apps for everybody, and what kind of way are we connecting our apps? So just a snapshot of the thinking there and reinforced here with the uh, definitions of fringe, middleware, and core. <clears throat> and then talking about, all right, how do we host and uh, as we strive for agility, flexibility, and scale, how, what are our hosting uh, options? And so we, here are some that, uh, that are on one slide I just wanted to share with you without going into any detail. <clears throat> so what are the roles and responsibilities of EA uh, versus say solution architecture? So enterprise architects work with business relationship managers, stakeholders, and subject matter experts to build an enterprise-wide strategy around the use of IT. This is one organization's example okay that's not what i'm promoting but i'm giving you a, a real world snapshot and then the solution architects are responsible for low level technical design and documentation how to actually implement the approved solutions and put together the blueprints that the engineers will use so we have the solution architects need to work with the enterprise architects with the program management office with the engineering teams so we see that nexus uh, there that's essential and across the life cycle so we can see with this picture, I wanted to share how they're showing, uh, again, the connection to the business, uh, to the EA slash IT, to the solutions and to the engineering as they move from uh, the capability type level to the detailed uh, implementation requirements. <clears throat> and again, who's responsible across the life cycle. So again, just some snapshots to say people working uh, need to work beyond just the EA within itself across its, its uh, domains, we need to also work with solution architects and engineers. And that's where I, I said that we need to look at strategy, we need to look at architecture writ large, not just enterprise architecture. We need to look at management, so that covers the business and the IT, and we need to look at innovation uh, as we're, as we're uh, looking across these, uh, the life cycle. And so this is, uh, again, looking at the whole life cycle responsibilities for that snapshot, a little amplification on that. Measure and understand, again, very important that we, that we are, in fact, looking at what difference is the architecture making, the enterprise architecture, and is it, are we seeing it with the solutions that we're actually rolling out? Are they, are they aligned to where we said we were going are they are they moving toward our principles and the like as we um, interact? 
So again, uh, how do we interact is the question. This is just a couple of things showing how we work with different folks across in this one sample organization, organization ABC. Work with vendors, work with security, work with PMO for, di for different elements. And then how do we ultimately enable? Through standards-based principles, simple, scalable, service-oriented, strategic, reliable, sustainable, secure, and then focused on the future state as we're looking at our overall management. How are we supporting our, our target state with our, our investments and our, our platforms? All right, so those are some, some things that I wanted to hit on, and I'm going to wrap up here in just a couple more minutes, <clears throat> but I, I wanted to reinforce the fact that they, they brought out some good uh, measurements here to say how, as we're looking to the future state, what difference is architecture making? Business capability to applications, application functionality redundancy score, network function virtualization score, API payload rationalization score, and the like here. Artifact usage by area. So the, the idea of usage and measuring are, are very important <clears throat> uh, for this. And a, a major focus for, uh, for along those lines is uh, if we're going to rationalize our application landscape, which should be a priority in a lot of places, how do we do that? And so again, what's, uh, what's the cost to value? And so uh, often a, high, a priority effort for a lot of the organizations I'm working with is an application rationalization. So some of the core principles uh, tied to uh, integration or orchestration, data transformation, their transport protocol negotiations, mediation, and uh, non-functional consistency, which is tying the ability that, that security and monitoring policies are applied and, and implemented, and additionally, goals of scalability and availability achieved through, for example, high availability clustering. So some ideas of the non-functional. And then uh, as we move, again, as a modern example, looking at APIs. Uh, and different types of API. So again, a real world thing is not, so it's not just purely conceptual. We're, we're seeing how, how people are looking at, you know, how do we work with these uh, apps rationalization? How do we work with the apps uh, to connect them with different kinds of uh, layers of APIs? So again, there's a lot of richness in the architecture. So I wanna go just a little bit more and then uh, take questions. Uh, this, the new rules of EA. So this is um, reflected a little bit and, and what I was showing there with the analysis, even though I just wanted to give you a, a, a breeze through that uh, in my ambitious uh, webinar here. Uh, the new EA is calling for revolution. And uh, there are seven rules coming out of the RDOC company, A-R-D-O-Q, which I'll add in uh, later uh, as a reference, that was the set of references I mentioned. But, uh, Businesses have never had a greater need for enterprise architecture. So even though I said there's some anti-patterns there, there's some issues, this is coming from our docs research and working closely, in fact, with Gartner uh, on this. They're an EA modeling tool in, in, uh, in uh, Norway, EA modeling company with a tool. And uh, so again, we have the whole digital transformation that's occurring. And that's a big driver. And so I've mentioned Gartner a couple of times, but um, here we have uh, research linked to, to Gartner. The 72% 70 of organizations are either starting, restarting, or renewing their EA efforts, right? So it says, however, traditional EA is widely seen as having failed, okay? So that's, again, one of my motivators for having this little discussion. So Gartner from December 2017. So if we keep just looking at the same old maturity models and and and, and the same uh, kind of biases about frameworks, about modeling languages, about tools, uh, we're going to make the same mistakes. So so why is traditional EA missing its mark? Um, well, in the pre-digital age, it was about trying to align uh, business-led IT-enabled approach. Well, the basic uh, bottom line here is that it's more collaborative and, and better, better um, led through analytics, through intelligence that can help uh, 
help the business make decisions. So it comes to better managing, navigating, and informing decision making. So historically, linear solutions are no longer up to the task in terms of how do I analyze my architecture landscape, make recommendations for the next quarter, the next year, in light of all this complexity. So digital businesses must be agile, iterative, experimental, lean, constantly learning and adapting. EA must evolve to support this, moving away from seeking perfection with a, this perfect set of visuals or, or methods to, to delivering continuous improvements at speed with a lightweight, lightweight, pragmatic architecture, enabling smarter decisions faster, basically. So I'm just sharing some of the thoughts from our doc here that, and again, kind of a negative assessment of, uh, of traditional architecture being very linear and do stage one and then stage two and do step three and step four. And then, you know, it's like, it's really not that simple. So some of the new rules uh, for EA are the values in analytics, not the architectural products themselves. So traditional EA is focused on architecture where models created, populated, then used to generate scenarios. It's not possible to make sense of the outcome without understanding the model. However, business leaders are not interested in understanding the architecture. They need EA to help them better uh, make better decisions faster with insight and intelligence about their operations. Right. So we'll share this material with you again separately, the source material directly. Um, the values in analytics, a little bit more on that, ability to analyze complex structured data, to be able to have meaningful conversations for competitive business outcomes, very key. Start with the business problem, okay? We don't do tech for tech's sake. It should be business driven, but informed by analytics. Okay, again, leaving rigid architecture frameworks behind, and I, I, I'm the last one to say, let's use a rigid architecture framework. That's one reason I like TOGAP, because TOGAP says you must customize it. It, it must not be rigid, in fact. And so a lot of people misunderstand TOGAF as, as somehow normative in terms of what must be done. So I, I, I think most people who, who think that don't know it very well, <clears throat> because it can't be done without customization and without without agility and, and the sorts of things that in fact uh, we're, we're seeing here in fact starting with the business problem we can do that with TOGAF. <clears throat> Get the right data into the system in the right format. Okay the data data centricity aspect here in, in, in the sense that you no know, we really need to understand what data is behind whatever decisions we're making whether they're you know creating through uh, uh, created through models or, or what have you, we need to understand uh, the data structures, the data flows and algorithms and collect the data accordingly. And this is uh, uh, following along with that. I've had a lot of folks recently saying they realize to better uh, do better in their EA efforts going forward, they have to put more emphasis on data architecture and data science. And so that's, uh, that's a really strong uh, driver in the overall ecosystem right now is uh, data science and, and what's possible through better analytics and through augmented intelligence and the like. And again, more customizability there. E new EA is customer driven. Okay. Put the user first. And a little bit more on that. Knowing that in a few months, people are going to want different things. So we have to customize for that. The new EA broadens access and empowers collaboration. So that's uh, one takeaway. And again, you'll be able to study these things in more detail when we send you the, the raw documents uh, as a follow on to the webinar for those who, who participated. Okay. Dynamic software models, again, uh, supported also by Gartner, to deliver situation awareness and support improved enterprise decisions. And then built in integrated security and regulatory compliance. One of the big drivers for the renewal of interest in architecture is in fact this ability to help at the data level for compliance regimes. And more on that 
in terms of uh, being able to use uh, augmented and artificial intelligence, graph technologies, data augmentation, automated gap ana analytics, automated data duplication detection, and also digital twins to, to organize your thinking about all the elements and relationships across your whole, your whole organization. And finally, speed and efficiency are the new, are the new normal. So an agile methodology enables decision-making based on speed, not perfection. Okay. So EA analytics is, is very key. So I have some additional material that uh, I'm going to make available to you separately. But at, uh, at this time, I would like to uh, take questions um, and, uh, and then be happy, as I said, to follow up with extra material. I strongly recommend workshop one or two day workshop to dive into this type of thinking because there are so many anti-patterns people are failing with their ea efforts but there are ways to use frameworks and tools and maturity approaches that can work that have you bringing value while you're building out your capability so it's a two-pronged approach it's very possible and actually very essential uh, to uh, to do this, those focus less on I'm building an EA program that will last forever, then I'm bringing EA capability now, right? And it's only going to get better. All right, so I'd like to take uh, any questions uh, for about 10 minutes uh, or so. Excellent. Well, we have had a few people write questions in as you've gone along, Steve. So I might read a few of the earlier ones um, just so you can answer those. Celia Norton has asked, how do you propose to talk with business who do not know about Archimate, showing models in Archimate and get them to be engaged? So okay. any thoughts on how to address executives with the rigor and discipline of Archimate? Okay, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, I, don't, I don't think we should be showing Archimate models to, to business people. So, my, my discussion about TOGAF and Archimate was for uh, training the architects, right? And be able to talk about uh, architecture in terms of how one layer supports another layer and so forth. But for, for um, talking to the business, I'm more of a boxes and lines uh, kind of guy, a, a dynamic interactive drill down uh, type of presentations uh, uh, to, to answer questions for the leadership about capability and how we're getting it now versus how we're going to get it in the future. And I, I, um, I think the ability to, uh, to have these real-time interactive discussions is critical. So tools that support that are, are very important. Now, Archimate can support that, the drill down, but, but it, it's a little too complex for, uh, you know, for business folks, and we don't want to confuse them. So I think that's, a, that's another area for rethinking architecture. That's, there's some work being done on that, but it's how do we create how do how do we respect that we need a, in fact a different language for different stakeholders so i'm not recommending archimate for briefing the business excellent um another question um how do you with togaf see what needs to be standardized and where you can allow for specialized flows okay w would you start with the first part of that again yeah absolutely um how do you with TOGAF see what needs to be standardized and where you can allow for specialized flows? Okay, so um, I, I'm going to provide a, a separate webinar for a demo of, of the um, forms, the web based forms that we've set up that. Uh, it's just obviously too much to cover today, but but what we've done after many years of experimentation is saying, look, you know, TOGAF gives you a lot of ideas, but it doesn't get you started. You have to read the book and you have to, you get a, some generic plug-in tool and you start working with that tool, but it's, it needs to be simpler. We just need to come up with forms that experts help you create that, uh, that we do, we've already created, and that uh, ask the key questions, pulling parts from TOGAF, but also from other areas beyond just TOGAF. To, you know, talking about reference models, reference architectures, and so forth. Like TOGAF will say, come up with a reference model, but it won't tell you what, you know, where, where is one? Where, where could I find one? 
So, so web forms that allow you to pull, answer the key questions and add questions and customize questions, you know, for, for a streamlined approach, what, what's my questionnaire, what's my questionnaire going to be like for the first uh, 90 days, right? Mm -hmm. And then how would I change my questionnaire for if I'm going to do blockchain or how would I do it for a multi-cloud rollout? So the ability to have the web, web forms already extensively there and ability to customize them, to change the questions and save different versions of your questions and, uh, and then to do uh, data assurance for the answers and to be able, you're actually able then to export the answers to key questions uh, to, different, uh, to different formats and different tools, to Excel spreadsheets, to, to um, uh, which then could be imported into a modeling tool, for example. But, but the idea that I that I'm really promoting to to that to make TOGAF totally usable, is is that we, you need to go through and customize the questions to your your maturity and your priorities at the time. And that doesn't take that long. That, that, that wouldn't take more than like a week, you know, to do the customization of the forms. And then from doing the customization of the forms, you would perhaps would need to help have a little help ultimately to build workflows. And that would be more customized service support. But the web forms are already a huge step forward, and we're going to be providing those in beta uh, for for folks to play around with them soon, and uh, and see the potential of once you've collected that data, reusing it in different places, and in, uh, in repository and deliverables and in artifacts. And the like. So, so again, just having the book is pretty useless, and just having a plugin that's that's tied to the, you know, the, the crop circle, if you will, that's everything's kind of still disaggregated. I, I wanted an, an, a totally integrated approach that go that that, that realizes, for example, TOGAF has steps, but it also has approaches, and it also has a, advice in different parts of the book. Well, in the web forms, we we did all of that. In a, in a way that uh, it's integrated and that does require then a coordination of like, for example, in, in the web forms that we have, like 200 people could work on those forms at the same time. It's a very sophisticated engine. And also um, there, there's basic uh, accountability on who's filling out which part of the form. And then like I say, you build that into a workflow uh, then as you mature. But initially, you need to get your, you know, a, a, a consensus on the set of questions and what it would be acceptable answers and who's responsible for which part, right? So that's so I think it's it, it it's very doable, and it's it, it's by experimenting uh, with it that one learns. And I I, I hope that uh, people will will uh, have a chance to try that out uh, very soon. Uh, the the beta version uh, will be ready in May. Uh, for people to experiment with, but for extra options like workflow and 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 uh, connections to certain tools, Confluence, SharePoint, et cetera, that 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 again uh, uh, would be more customized. But but it is essential to go from book knowledge to actually having qu questions that matter to you uh, at the at the time of your in terms of your knowledge, skills, and abilities and maturity. And and that you're that you're able to to make that simple and straightforward, and that you can get people answering those questions in in an aggressive way, um, that and you can see the value quickly. Excellent. Um, now, just quickly, because we are almost out of time, um, someone has just asked: Are the web forms based on the seven rethink new ways to do EA? They include that, and. But that's why I'm saying it's it's not just TOGAF. They're EA aligned with TOGAF, but enriched with knowledge from other frameworks. So the web forms um, are reinforcing the fact that TOGAF is never meant to be used alone. So we're bringing in ideas about have you coordinated, like TOGAF says, have you coordinated with the PMO? Have you synchronized and harmonized what you're doing, you know, with the risk management folks? And are you really ready? You know, for one thing that we integrated, for example, were, were that all the techniques that are in TOGAF. So as you're doing a step, it calls out a technique. Well, we we have the questions there to go ahead and fill out that technique. You know, the the forms for that technique as part of you know all in in a in a, in a way that that's uh, very tight and integrated, and you're not jumping all over the place, right? So you have the application architects filling out the application phase, all the questions coordinating with the data architecture folks and with the uh, the uh, infrastructure folks and so forth. So so you have 
a kind of massive uh, 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 tackling, uh, uh, refinement and then tackling of the questions, but ones that, that hit not just the steps and approaches in TOGAP, but also the techniques and guidelines, but also some suggestions that we provide from other frameworks and from this newer thinking, because TOGAP thinking hasn't been updated in quite a while. So that's why we're updating it through these web forms and allow you to update it. Excellent. Well, unfortunately, that is all we have for time at the moment um, well, for this webinar. Um, but thank you, Steve, very much for, for presenting and thank you to everyone for attending. If your question didn't get answered during the time that we had, we are going to endeavour to compile all the questions and provide answers to you that we will share shortly. Um, as a thank you to everyone for tuning into the webinar today, we're also going to be offering you a money back offer when you register for one of our upcoming training courses. Um, I will be sending out information on that shortly, along with um, the slides and a link to the recording of this webinar for you to view within your own time. This concludes the webinar for today. Thank you again to everyone for joining and taking the time out of your day. Um, Steve, I'll let you say a, a quick goodbye and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Sure. I, I really do encourage you to follow up with questions as well. So you should have our, our email is training at eaprinciples.com and uh, we will take, take all the questions and we'll share them uh, as well with folks. So we expect some follow up from this. I do very much encourage people not to feel overwhelmed with the EA. Uh, given that there's a great interest, I just want to help people realize there, there are incremental steps to take to create value while you're building your capability. And that's what our one to two day workshops can help with. And they're not just TOGAF centric, but they, a lot of people want to know about TOGAF because it's uh, the most broad approach. But, uh, but we, we were able to entertain other, other frameworks as well. But, but uh, a workshop, we've had great success with our two day workshops where people say, Tell, give me some EA frameworks, give me some reference models, give me some reference architectures. Let's talk about uh, you know, the method. Let's talk about content. Let's learn a little bit about modeling and let's start tackling some of our highest priorities uh, in, this, uh, in this space. If I, I, I just want to show you one, one quick thing that I have set up in preview that, that um, I do recommend that you, uh, that you do the ma magic quadrant there for um, uh, EA tools. We'll send you that. Uh, that has got a lot of good stuff, but it's, as I said, it's, it's not the highest priority. The other thing that I wanted to share with you is, I, I will share with you that it's very popular, is um, that people should look at, uh, and our workshop covers this, but we come up with the benefits, the challenges, the metrics, and priority initiatives for doing um, EA. And this is based on extensive work done already that I, I give it to you at a high level, but I, I don't want to contaminate it for you to come up with and modify it yourselves. But we found these to be very useful for people thinking about what are in fact the benefits of EA writ large, perhaps informed by TOGAP. However, what are the challenges and blockers? How would we measure success and what should we do next? Right, so that that we'll share this with you at a high level. If somebody wants that at a more detailed level, we'll do that at a separate a second mail out um, tied to perhaps next steps uh, in terms of helping you overall. But thank you very much, and best of luck to you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.